All the second stage tanks now pressurized. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This is Honey Badger Radio. Radio with Honey In order to maintain the female victim identity, feminists need men's identity to simultaneously be perpetrator and protector. How can they possibly achieve that? HBR Talk with Hannah Wallen. Men, the victim identity cult really wants their concern for you acknowledged. They want it so much they can't wait to tell you all about their astounding level of compassion. Really, they're just chomping at the bit, fidgeting with anxiety over the men's movement's disturbing lack of acknowledgement of just how much feminists really do care about men. So much, in fact, that you just have to listen or no one can believe you also care about men, even if you are one. What's wrong with you, you misandric jerks? So, what do they want to talk about? Toxic masculinity, of course. It's such a terrible, horrible, burdensome problem that it supersedes all of the issues the men's movement exists to discuss. It might even be bigger than feminist issues, bigger than the pay gap, rape culture, even bigger than mansplaining. Why, it's even bigger than the fact that patriarchy hurts men, too. Why? Because it's the underlying cause behind every issue that has ever happened anywhere. If it's not a direct cause, it's the cause of the conditions that led to the direct cause. Seriously, there isn't anything feminists can't trace back to it. It's probably even the reason why your chewing gum lost its flavor on the bedpost overnight. And uh, what exactly is toxic masculinity? We hear a lot about its symptoms, most of which can be distilled down to the supposed normalization of selfish, crass buffoonery that 13-year-olds think is funny, but mostly grow beyond by the time they're adults. You know, things dads who haven't been evicted from their families train their sons out of as they're growing up, in part by telling them such behaviors are childish and unmanly. To what does the toxic masculinity narrative attribute this alleged normalization? Supposedly that is caused by social attitudes, but the cult's narratives only describe those attitudes in terms of men's and boys' responses to them. Stoicism, promiscuity, contempt for women, violent aggression, all based on the presumed expectations of the people around them as dictated by some agreed-upon image of what constitutes a real man. You know, the kind of thing boys might learn growing up if their elder role models are all their neighborhood bullies or distant representations they only experience through their female role models' complaints or from stories on television and in movies. Things they might learn in an environment characterized by a society-wide compassion deficit toward men and boys. How awful, right? But who would create such an environment? Feminists tell us that the male suicide rate is so much higher than the female suicide rate because our society doesn't allow men to cry enough, to express their feelings, to talk about their problems, so they keep them bottled up until the pain becomes too much. Unable to handle it anymore, they self-destruct. Ignoring for a moment the fact that guys heal psychologically through doing, not just through crying, though they can express that way, Let's consider the idea that feminists have proposed. Men, they tell us, should be, quote, allowed to express their emotions and talk about their problems. Okay, so who's stopping them? Who is it that decides which emotions men are allowed to have and which they may not? When a man faces a false accusation of reprehensible behavior, who treats his outrage and anger at being the subject of shocking and humiliating lies as evidence of his guilt? 
Who calls every false accusation that is exposed to the public a chance to start a conversation about the type of perpetration the accuser has alleged, yet adamantly refuses to have any conversation about the incidents and impact of false accusations themselves? When advocates for male victims of female perpetrated intimate partner and sexual violence speak up about their experiences and their recovery needs, who responds by downplaying the rate of incidents and the impact of victims' experiences? Who deflects to discussion on male perpetration? Who accuses men who want the right to self-defense of wanting an excuse to beat women? Who accuses men's advocates of trying to use male victims to downplay women's experiences? Who, in every discussion on the topic, no matter how it started, treats male victims as invaders trespassing on female territory? Who tells them men should sit down, shut up, and wait until the female victims are done talking? Who is it that responds to men's complaints about unfair treatment in family court by demonizing them as deadbeats, abusers, liars, and thieves of parenting time who are only trying to hurt the mothers of their children? Who castigates alienated fathers for expressing pain and sadness in response to their circumstances? Who mocks their separation anxiety, or worse, calls it creepy. When alienated fathers like Thomas Ball and Chris Mackney commit suicide as a result of the impact of corrupt family court decisions on their lives, who is it that accuses them of doing it as a last-ditch way to abuse their ex-wives? Who responds to men's issues discussion online by calling the men involved a bunch of whiny man-babies who don't actually do anything, then driving activists like Earl Silverman to suicide when they do try to do something, and finally calling the suicide itself an attack on feminists. The feminist message is apparently, we want you to show emotion, but only when your interests don't conflict with feminist narratives. We want you to cry, but only about feminist-approved problems. Any other expression of self-interest is bad, and shame on you for even thinking about it. What do you get when you raise boys in an environment like that? where they're surrounded by feminine mentors and ugly, openly disdained representations of masculinity, told they should be more open and expressive, and then demonized for expressing any self-interest. When their caregivers, the gods of their world, promise compassion, but deliver condemnation instead. You get male feminists. How would a person deal with being raised, not as a potential contributor to the greatness of society, but as the cause of all of its evils, with little useful guidance on how to make himself an asset rather than a detriment to society. He'd find a demon to be the cause of his corruption, something that could be exercised, or something that could be blamed any time he happens to offend, something like toxic masculinity. While many young men who adopt feminist narratives do so with the best of intentions, believing it to be the wisest outlet for their mostly traditional chivalry, most grow out of their misconceptions and leave the movement for more productive ways to interact with the world. However, the excuse provided by the toxic masculinity narrative would be an attractive tool for a scam artist or a predator, just as it is to those among feminist women. Toxic masculinity caused my bad behavior is the devil made me do it of feminism. It's an excellent blame sink. Said the wrong thing in front of your gender studies professor? Shed a few tears, abase yourself, and apologize. Sorry, ma'am, that was a manifestation of toxic masculinity, wasn't it? Golly, gee, my bad. I have learned so much from this experience. You're such a great teacher. Exit classroom left at an emotionally liberated pace. Just remember, if confronted by this feminist, whatever bad thing it is he is doing, you just have to teach him not to do it anymore, and it's all good. Groper, no groping! Groper, no groping! Groper, no groping! Aw, oh, man! It's the perfect tool for a bully, too. You just have to do it in the name of protecting women from other men's toxic masculinity. In that context, it becomes the perfect rationalization for othering, especially at the behest of feminist women who openly demand it with poster campaigns, campus initiatives, even speeches to the United Nations. Got some pent-up aggression? Well, somewhere on the internet there's an anti-feminist or men's advocate right now who needs to hear from a feminist man immediately. 
Why this intervention could be key to preventing an incident of male violence. Not that the feminist bully knows anything firsthand about male violence, of course, because he's never started any fights. He's only defended women against other men who looked like they might be getting ready to do something unfeminist. Besides, it's not aggression when you're heading toxic masculinity off at the pass, right? The feminist bully isn't the bad guy. You are. You'd better not forget that, either, be you male or female. If you're going to discuss human rights issues from a gender equality perspective, you'd better be ready to submit your ideas for approval by the Toxic Masculinity Avenger. No, he's not the hero men need. He's not the hero women need. He's the hero feminist demanded. After all, we can't have people thinking for themselves without the cult's supervision, can we? And how is that not toxic? Hello and welcome to HBR Talk 76, How to Train Your Demon, Toxicity of Feminist Masculinity's Narratives. I'm your host, Hannah Wallen, here with the lovely and intelligent Anna Cherry, She Who Must Be Obeyed, Karen Strawn, and Nonsense Annihilator, Lauren B., to break down the way feminists try to break down men. But first, as usual, we got a couple of things to go over, like the fact that if you haven't already, you need to head on over to badgerfeed.com and register to receive notifications if you want to know what the badgers have going on every day. If you want to support our work, even in the midst of all the financial blacklisting that is taking place today, feedthebadger.com is the most stable way to help. So remember, information is power and we have it. Go to badgerfeed.com for information, feed the badger to help support us share the information. And uh, speaking of sharing information, don't forget to smash that like button and share us on every social media site you use. Also, don't yeah. forget, it's Steak and Blowjobs Day, so share oh, that it information. Is. It is indeed. I thought that was oh. Valentine's Day. Oh, it's a month oh. after. Oh, I see. Yeah. A month after, yep. Oh, holy hell, I don't have a steak for my man. <laughs> oh. There's just going to have to be extra blowjobs. You, you can pretend his dick is the steak and give it a blowjob. Uh, there. There you go. So, remember guys, feminists are not trying to control you. They're just trying to free you from toxic masculinity. The phenomenon of men making their own choices outside of feminist control. And that's totally not the same thing, right? It is. It is. You know, it's totally the same thing. You know, like one of the things that, that gets me about this is, you know, there was, um, oh God, there was a, uh, a survey done of young men, right? Men in elementary school, right? And one of the things that, uh, you know, about toxic masculinity, apparently, right? And one of the things that these young boys lamented was that they would never be able to become a mother. And I don't think that the survey takers actually logged um, any information as to whether the boys who said that they would never be able to become a mother were raised without fathers, right? So we're raised in a condition in which the only parents that were exemplified for them, that were modeled for them, were mothers, right? And uh, so I'm, I'm just like looking at it like, we have a serious freaking problem here. We have a serious problem with boys not being able to find a way as boys, right? And I'm seeing this, you know, with an increasing number of youth who are identifying as trans. I'm seeing this with an, you know, an increase in the, uh, in the identification of children as trans because they uh, they violate the gender binary in some way, it's a, it almost feels like it's kind of a a an extension of the gender equality paradox in the Scav Scandinavian countries, right? So as you flatten out all of the environmental factors and the social pressures, right? What you see is uh, men and women becoming more different. Right. And if that means that the binary is actually becoming more extreme, 
um, what you might see is somebody like uh, a tomboy uh, being, you know, kind of essentially encouraged to label herself as a trans boy, right, rather than a girl, and, and, a, and a boy who likes some feminine things like playing with dolls, essentially saying, well, there's no place in masculine culture for me, so I must be a girl, right? So I'm, I'm just kind of like, what the fuck are we doing here? Um, because essentially if, if you're, I think that honestly, if you're raised without a father as a boy, right. And you do not have your, your mother does not go out of her way to, uh, have a daily or, you know, uh, semi daily male, healthy male role model in your life. And maybe the first daily role model, male role, adult male role model in your life is your eighth grade math teacher, right? Which by then it's too late. What you're seeing is parenting equals mothering, right? Um, and so of course you're going to say, well, you know, I, I really, uh, I, I, I feel sad about the fact that I'll never be able to become a mother when what they're really saying is I'm sad about the fact that I'll never be able to become a parent. Um, because they've just never had somebody of their gender uh, around them who was a parent. Um, you know, maybe they were raised in a whole community that that is uh, in that condition, right? Council houses in your in the UK or or the projects in the United States, things like that, right? So I'm I'm just wondering, like, we actually have to give boys a place uh, to inhabit a role to inhabit. And I think honestly, this idea that there are no roles and it's all up in the air and you know, you can completely untether yourself from everything. And, and I, I actually think that that's confusing and, and uh, damaging to kids. I think that, you know, you, you have to make allowances for the kids who are really, really strongly, um, really strongly feel like, okay, I, I, was born in the wrong body or whatever, right? Or, or intersex youth and things like that. You have to make allowances for that. You have to make exceptions for that. But this idea that uh, because those, uh, that tiny percentage of people exist and have always existed, right? That, that means that it's a complete free for all. Um, I think that that leaves boys more than girls completely abandoned um, completely untethered from any sense of purpose and from any kind of uh, role that they might aspire to. And I also think that being raised with a single mother, the way mothers tend to parent, uh, it's not the way I parented, um, but it's the way mothers tend to parent, uh, leaves boys uh, with the impression that natural boy behavior is bullying, um, that that natural boy testing of their peers, right? Because boys naturally and sort of instinctively test their peers, put them through, um, I guess you would call them informal hazing rituals on the playground and stuff like that. Um, that, that that's all a form of bullying and uh, that there's, there's, it's arbitrary and mean rather than something that's, uh, that serves a purpose and, and is ingrained in, in boys. So it's, it's just, I think, honestly, boys are so susceptible right now to the feminist narrative that it's the world that's at fault. It's the world that's in the wrong, right? And that, that, that there, is no, uh, there is no way for you to be, to fit in, be yourself. And if the world doesn't conform to you, and and what you uh, what you want for yourself, which kids don't even know. I can tell you that right much right now. Um, if the world doesn't conform and and affirm that for you, then it, there's something wrong with the world, and and so therefore the world is a, a horrible uh, uh, oppressive place, right? That that has no room for you, right? And so I'm I'm just like. I'm just like looking at this from the perspective of, of a parent who raised two sons and a daughter and two stepsons. And, and I'm thinking like, this is, we, we are really, you know, like you look at girls and they have, what has happened with girls is we've 
expanded the girl role, right? Like, so you can be a girl, you can have girl power, you can be a CEO, you can be a scientist, you can be all these things that men are, you can be a firefighter, you can be all of this stuff We and, and still be a girl, right? But we have not done that for boys. Uh, what we've done is essentially said, there's no role for you. So we be have, a girl instead. And we've gotten to the point where boys are hearing everywhere they go that being a boy is bad. Now, imagine, exactly. yeah. imagine what would happen to your brain growing up. I, and I mean, I'm sure all the guys can imagine, but imagine what would happen to your developing brain as a child if all of the messages that you got about your gender boil down to you're a monster, you're a mistake, you're flawed, you're, you should have been a girl, uh, everything you do is wrong. Uh, everybody that that's like you that's an adult is bad what would happen even even not just in terms of psychologically but in terms of brain chemistry to be constantly put down that way throughout your entire childhood because that's basically psychological abuse yeah absolutely Fem feminist idea of helping men is making them realize that they need to be more like women when treating men like women does not help men it just doesn't. It doesn't fucking work. I'll tell, I'll tell you what happens. Uh, suicide epidemic. Yeah. Well, what, what bothers me too is, right, this idea that, um, and you see it, I saw it just today on Twitter, right? You men have been mansplaining for millennia. So sit, sit your ass down and, and listen for a change, right? Um, and uh, so it, it really is this idea of, um, because of whether true or false, right, rightly or wrongly, the men of the past have uh, have been judged, right? Therefore, we judge you now in this time and place, right? And so we see all of these things with uh, these programs, you know, where boys have to stand up in a gymnasium and pledge to never hit a girl, never hurt a woman, all of this stuff to take responsibility for the entirety of the problem of domestic violence, right? This is your burden now moving forward is to, is to, uh, to acknowledge that male violence against women is uh, in part your responsibility, right? It, it, even though you've never done it, it's your responsibility to fix it because of the transgressions real or imagined of men who died, you know, D decades or hundreds of years ago, right? Um, it, it's it's an absolutely atrocious thing to place on a man, and I think that, or on a boy, and I think that as well, you know, like you you will get these these boys and young men who will who will gravitate to that because they really want to be good, right? And they want a role, right? And then they're told, you know, you don't, you don't deserve a cookie just for being a decent human being, right? You know, it's your duty to amplify women's voices, but don't expect any gratitude from us when you do, um, because you're, you're only, it really is like Tom Golden said in that speech at ICMI 14, you know, with the, the couple in bed and then there's a noise downstairs. And if she gets up with, you know, the baseball bat and goes and investigates Right. She's a hero. She's like girl power. She's like, you know, and that's great. Right. And if if he does it, he's just doing his job. And if she doesn't do it, that's OK, because that's not her role. And if he doesn't do it, he's a coward. Right. So there really is no way to win uh, for men in a lot of these situations. Right. And the way feminism plays on those sort of chivalristic instincts um, that men have. Right, that you need to. Oh my God, dog! Do you have to eat and drink right now? Um, to uh, to essentially uh, compel men to do what they have always done, which is protect women and children, sometimes with their lives, right? And uh, but then you don't get a cookie for it. You don't get any, get any acknowledgement just for being a decent human being. Right. And you are doing this not because it is in your nature to do it. You are doing this because of, uh, you know, in order to atone for millennia of the oppression of women by your forefathers. Right. That that is why you are expected to do this now. Um, it's not because women want men to 
protect and provide for them. It's not because that's the way everything's always been. It's not the way, it's not because that's the way men's natures have always been to protect and provide for their women and their children, right? It's not because of any of that. You're making up for the, uh, for the, for the wrongdoings of the men in the past. You're not just fulfilling your destiny as a male, which is something that deserves honor, right? You are not fulfilling a masculine, a traditional masculine role, which has always been honored and has always been rewarded with respect and gratitude. No, you are doing the bare minimum to make up for the fact that the entirety of human history has been one giant crime by men against women and you need to make up for it and you don't deserve a cookie for that. So it's, it's, it's a horrendous, horrendous freaking thing. It's attractive, I think, to, to boys who are seeking a role, who do not have seeking one, um, or whose fathers are feminist and sell it to them. Um, but I think that uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly damaging and these boys tend to go one of two ways. They rebel against that role um, and they go and start listening to Ben Shapiro um, or, uh, or they, uh, they, they stick with it because there is something in themselves that they recognize in the feminist narrative. And you think of the think of the two roles that that really leaves for them too, because you've got you've got the knight in shining armor role, the protector provider who is responsible for the actions of all other men and who is responsible for protecting all women from all other men and in particular the women around them from all the men around but them. But not deserving, but not deserving, right, but not deserving of any gratitude, right? Um, and and. Uh, at, at some point, you know, he has to take his own sense of satisfaction from it, but because if you don't, you know, you, you really lose your mind. But then the other end of it is there's no place for, for a guy to fall from except to, to become the exact polar opposite, the monster that, you know, the, the supposedly good guys are trying to protect all of the women from. And imagine being the guy who has that cognitive dis dissonance and, and you know that maybe doesn't see uh, things through the feminist lens entirely and maybe looks at the women around him and wonders why they're so dumb honestly um, that they can't they can't take measures to protect themselves uh, wonders why they're so annoying that they they can't uh, leave men a place to exist without being the bad guy and at some point some of these guys are going to basically get it in their head well I'm going to be the bad guy no matter what I do I might as well be the bad guy in real life uh, and I kind of wonder if a lot of this narrative a lot of this you know m masculinity is naturally predatory and you have to learn to be a protector instead of the other way around I, I kind of wonder if a lot of that is what leads to when it turns out to be true that a feminist man uh, who's been accused, you know, did what he's accused of, um, when it turns out to be that, that someone like, ah, oh, God, I can't think of his name, Peter Schweizer, was it? Uh, uh, Hugo Schweizer. Hugo Schweizer. I, 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 I don't know why I thought his name was Peter. Um, but yeah, Hugo Schweizer had his breakdown, and I kind of wonder if part of that was you know, you have these conflicting messages. Um, you're so, this is what a good person is. You're not naturally this. No man under any circumstance is naturally this. He has to learn to be this. And shame on you for expecting any kind of uh, uh, credit for, uh, for doing so, for making the conscious choice to be this, this uh, good role. Uh, you know, and, and again, you raise a what guy under that. It's damaging. What I found interesting about the Hugo Schweitzer case was he had a long history of like some really shitty behavior, right? Before he even started teaching women's studies at, uh, where was it in San Diego? Um, God, I forget what the college was. Um, but, uh, he had, he had a, he cucked a man. So he had, he impregnated a woman and she decided to stay with the man she was with. And he's pretty sure that the kid is his. 
and uh, he just let that go. And then he uh, he got with a woman who they had uh, both had drug problems, and he decided for both of them, not through a suicide pact, but for both of them, that uh, he was going to end their lives because they were so miserable. And he uh, tried to cause a gas leak that would cause an explosion. Um, when his uh, his ex girlfriend was passed out in the apartment, and he was hoping to kill them both, um, you know, and he admitted to all of this stuff. He wrote like long articles detailing all of these horrific things that he did, and then he found feminism, and he realized that none of those things were him. It was all just toxic masculinity, right? Um, so, and then he continued to have sex with female students and things like that. And then he talked to male students who had been taken advantage of when they were blackout drunk and uh, came to him saying like, uh, this woman really took advantage of me when I was blackout drunk and he talked them out of reporting them. And, you know, well, that's not really sexual assault and, and all of this stuff, right? Um, that, that was like, just a continuation of his life before his time, his tenure as a professor of women's studies, right? So it was, uh, and then he went on his weird Twitter diatribe because uh, he got all kinds of, um, here's the thing, here's the really sick thing, right? He got all kinds of kudos from feminists when he wrote those articles bearing his sins airing his sins in public, saying, you know, I did this and I did that and it was horrible and it was awful and I almost murdered my uh, my ex-girlfriend when I attempted to commit suicide and all of the these things that he admitted to on his public fucking blog, right? And he would get admiration from feminists for just admitting that this is just the way men are and, you know, thank you for owning what you did, you know, and, and acknowledging that it was really toxic masculinity and that it's really the fault of our culture and our, and, and the patriarchy and all of this shit. Right. So thank you for scapegoating our boogeyman for your but, atrocious behavior. Right. And that's, uh, that's, that's the problem. That's the problem with the term toxic masculinity, because it doesn't address the real problem. OK, they use it to paint this this idea of bad male behavior and, and it's, it's indicative of some somehow it's inherent, inherently male, which is not bad behavior. Anybody can be an asshole. <laughs> OK, man, woman, it doesn't matter. But they use they, they link the two together and now they can paint the entire other half of the population with this term and say it's your fault. You have to fix it instead well, what, of addressing the real fucking problems what one of the things that you know was in the intro uh that you know i'm gonna bring up again if i didn't last week um or if i did even if i did last week uh is that you know promiscuity promiscuity on the masculine norms uh, conformity to masculine norms inventory right well in the paper that mahalik who wrote that inventory who developed it right in the paper where he described how he developed that inventory, he cited that as coming from a book. And the book itself, as Teal Deer has revealed, uh, cited that 1% of surveyed men described uh, being a playboy or, you know, scoring or, you know, whatever you want to call it, being a picker, right? 1% of men uh, ranked that as among the top uh, important aspects of their masculinity, right? Among the top three, something like that, right? Whereas 30% of men or more, uh, about a third of men, ranked nurturing uh, as key to their masculinity. And about a third of men ranked uh, being a faithful partner as key to their masculinity. And yet those two things didn't make it onto the inventory, but promiscuity did, right? And you know, even though only 1% of men really care about that in terms of how they see themselves as men. So it's, I, I'm just blown away by how like farcical this entire thing is, right? And then on top of that, you think, okay, so promiscuity for a man, being a playboy as a man, that's toxic masculinity, okay? The expectation that he scores lots of hot chicks, but, okay, but, when you look at uh, 
Mahalik's conformity to feminine norms inventory, how did they describe it? They described it as uh, something, they didn't call it playboy, they didn't call it being a slut, they didn't call it anything like that. Um, they called, they, they essentially described it in a completely different way, in a way that wouldn't place the woman at the root of the behavior, right? The expectation to not be, be a prude or something like that is, is toxic femininity. So, um, so essentially we're still talking in terms of women being acted upon by society and by men that, that women's bodies are just the substrate upon which society and men write their actions and, and their, uh, their expectations. And, and I'm just like, really, this is, this is where we're at. You know, 1% of men, they get, they get on the list, not on the toxic masculinity list, just the conformity to masculine norms inventory list, right? 1% of men, they get their spot, right? 30% of men don't get their spot because, you know, well, women can be nurturing and women can be faithful, faithful partners too. So none of those are ex expectations of masculinity, right? Um, oh, and the interesting thing is, I think, uh, like feminism seems to have had, because of the sexual revolution, you know, sort of stemming from feminism, they seem to have had a goal of m normalizing promiscuity for women without normalizing any level of sexual freedom for men. And so they're going to do that. They're going to they're going to define it differently depending on whether they're talking about male sexuality or female sexuality. Uh, they need their way. narrative to to be conducive to demonizing male sexuality. Look at it this way, okay? Uh, a a man who exposes himself to somebody in public, right? Uh, that's he's committing a crime. He's not just committing like in indecent exposure. He's actually committing a sexual offense, right? A sexual offense on the women around him, right? Uh, women flash their tits all the time, right? Women flash their cooches all the time to, to, to men in bars and, and elsewhere. And, and they're, you know, maybe, maybe they'll get arrested for indecent exposure, but they aren't going to be arrested for a sex crime against the people around them. They're not going to, they're, that's, that's not going to be a thing that happens to them. They're no, not going to end sex offender registry for flashing their freaking cooch at some freaking uh, public event, some spring break or, or whatever, right? Because their They'll bodies organized are... to do it. Uh, yeah, you I get, you get somebody bodies... complain about a woman flashing her tits in public. The next thing you get is a group of, of uh, young, of nursing moms having a sit-in at your your restaurant or your business or whatever. Uh, all no, I, I don't, I don't even mind that nursing. Right? I don't even mind that because there's no sexual connotation to women. No, there's no sexual connotation to nursing, but the idea that there's no sexual connotation to breasts is a different story. Yeah, but if you're if you're whipping out your boob and breastfeeding your kid in public, right? You know, I mean, like, be be reasonably uh, discreet. Re reasonably discreet, right? And I, I've seen this because I, you know, being a server, right? I've, I've served uh, women who've been breastfeeding their kids while I've been looking after them at their table, right? And so have some of the male servers. And I've always noticed that the male servers get way more uncomfortable than I do. And it's because they don't want to be seen as, it's like they're in this catch-22, right? I don't want to look at her because then she might think I'm looking at her boob, right? and being salacious and, and predatory and gross and creepy, right? But I don't want to look away because that would make her uncomfortable about the fact that she's breastfeeding in public. Right, or or even to the degree of, uh, you know, her taking it personally. I, and I, and yeah. I've seen that. And there are women who, to be fair, there are women who uh, basically sit around looking for ways to be offended over that. Oh and, yeah, no. You know. but, but there are also women like I've come across who've like who've been like, you know, there Mistreated was a treated over couple. it. No, 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 no. I've never seen that. But I have seen. I have had an experience with a young couple. They were, you know, with their newborn eating dinner, and then she leaves and goes down to the to the washroom, 
Yeah. Um, and she just is not coming up, not coming up, not coming up. And I asked him, is she okay down there? And he says, oh, she's feeding the baby. And I'm like, what the hell is she doing feeding the baby in the bathroom? Right? Um, you know, we have this huge, mostly empty restaurant here with these, you know, uh, a, a section I could, like, all she had to do was ask and I would have, you know, she, like, I don't mind if she does it right at the table. That's fine. But if she feels a little uncomfortable, she could all section that's closed off and uh and she could sit at one of the tables there no problem right and he said well she's just very insecure about it and and i'm just like oh my god right so we got we got to find a balance in that but um but yeah so I, i've seen i've seen women who have like sort of taken it upon themselves to to essentially like shun themselves and put themselves in a public bathroom to feed their kids which is just gross in my mind Right, it's but not very I've sanitary. Yeah, no, but I've also seen women flip the fuck out because somebody said could, you know, somebody looked at them a little bit funny because they didn't yeah, put or, cloth over top or or, or whatever. Offered the um, offered them the opportunity for some privacy. You know, would you yeah. like some privacy? How dare you suggest I need privacy for this? Um, yeah. I've, I've had Nobody that Nobody did. Somebody asked people, if you wanted, you know. Yeah, people asking me, you know, would you like some privacy? And I'm like, no, I'm okay here. And they were fine with it. And they'll, they'll, they won't necessarily flip out so much if the person had asked them that is a woman either. But by golly, a man better not ask, you know. Yeah. You know, would you like some privacy? How dare you? Are you demonizing my boobs? When it's really, uh, he's not allowed to be uncomfortable um with the fact that you know the rest of the time her boobs are sexual but in this unique circumstance he's he's supposed to switch that you know, off without think, any 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 uh way to do so i think in many cases right in the cases that i've experienced where men have come up to me and said did, did you want to like have a you know go into the other room or like you know are you okay here they're being um, protective it, it was it was essentially like uh, we don't want you to feel uncomfortable breastfeeding in front of everybody if you don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, and the moment I said no, I'm okay out here, he was like, oh okay, right, and off he goes, right. And and it's like, so I don't even think it's him being uncomfortable. He's just worried that I might be doing something that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, no, no, well, and that's there's a big. Uh, tendency among men and boys and it's probably natural it's probably evolutionary to be very accommodating to women and girls especially as they get older um, I notice when they when they start hitting the teenage years and they start to get older if it looks like a girl in the room is upset or uncomfortable the first thing all the guys do you know except for the you know the guys and gals that are bullies are different but the regular Every day, you know, the rest of the class, the rest of the, the kids in the neighborhood um, immediately try to fix the problem. You know, what what's wrong? What can we do to help? And I, I think that that has, if you tie that in with the toxic masculinity narrative and the single mom situation, the fact that a lot of boys are raised in family environments where the only uh, images they get of men are, uh, you know, their their father being called a deadbeat, the men on TV being dumb, the the stars that the older kids are into, you know, getting into trouble with the law, um, all the, the emphasis of of uh, athletic men getting into trouble with the law, and and then they go to school and they get told about their toxic masculinity and they get told all these rules that they have to obey to um, basically make girls comfortable or to accommodate girls. And they have that natural uh, tendency to accommodate. You know, what's going to happen to them is they're going to, their their sense of self, their sense of uh, uh, importance as a human being is going to become smaller and smaller. Uh, and yeah. it is no wonder that they end up in a situation where they become suicidal. Exactly. They withdraw, you know. I mean, I see this, I, I've seen this for years. I, I've worked in a male-dominated industry for over 20 years, and I can tell you, I'm, I'm very comfortable around men. I, I'm more comfortable around men than I am with women. Um, but at the same time, I mean, these are, these are men that I've worked with for years, but they still 
treat me with kid gloves, you know, and I, I have the worst mouth out of all of them, you know, I, I have to hold myself back <laughs> because I don't want to make them blush, you know, but they, they still, you know, they're afraid to curse around me. I'm like, oh, really? Fuck. I, I've heard the word fuck before. You can, you can say it. You don't have to apologize. And it, it's, it's, it's sad. You know, you don't have to apologize. You're not going to offend me. I mean, I, I get it. It's a work environment. So they probably approach it from a different you know, respect level. But at the same time, I mean, we can hang out after work and the same thing still happens. You know, they just won't talk the same way they will with, if, if there's a woman, or it, when a woman's in the room, men don't talk the same way, you know? And I always hated that because these are people that I've known and known for a long time and they still treat me that way. Um, but yeah, it, I, <laughs> I hate that, that, uh, and it and it's one of those things that they kind of can't help. It's funny. I uh, yeah. I always used to joke about uh, you know, having the having the tendency to be invisible when I was in high school because I kind of cultivated that. It it makes doing the photography work I was doing much easier if people just don't notice you're around, and or they forget you're there. And I was able to uh, to do that a lot just in any given setting. I could basically, people wouldn't even realize I was in a room. Um, and I kind of like it that way anyway. Uh, it's, it's, I like to be around people, but at the same time I don't. It's, it's, it's one of those things. But in any case, I noticed there was a significant difference in the way guys around me would talk to each other when they noticed I was there when they would, were paying attention to the fact of who was in the room and everything. And when people would forget I was in the room, if it was a room full of guys, there would be an entirely different conversation. And it wasn't like they were talking dirty and being misogynistic or anything like that. They were just a lot more relaxed. Um, and that, that I think that's one of the things that affected uh, sort of my my view of uh, how guys are towards towards gals when they're the, the protective nature of guys is they they do have a, a tendency to coddle our sensibilities and I don't even think they do it necessarily consciously they're just on alert when a woman is in the room and it's it's interesting when you meet a guy who is not and and you're in the room with a an oversensitive woman and that guy because you can just sort of watch the dynamics um and she will get more and more riled up and he will just not give a fuck and it's fun to watch but uh but nine times out of ten it's it's the other way around you get you know men men do coddle women's sensibilities boys will coddle girls sensibilities and they won't even think about it and it's probably due uh to it's probably a reaction to an extent to uh to our neoteny um, and, and I know, uh, when you get a, a girl who is, has a more neotenous face, she's got bigger eyes, you know, they maybe are a little more wide set, um, you know, the doe eyes and, uh, and things like that, that make her look more childlike. It, it does seem to increase. So, and, and this is something that I do think that, that the feminist narrative takes advantage of, because you have that tendency to accommodate and you have that tendency to, um, basically men will mold themselves into what they, what messages they get that tell them what women want and, and they'll, they'll work very hard at it without necessarily even realizing they're doing it. And, uh, and if women want, you know, a man to protect them from all other men who are monsters, then that's what they get. And if women want a man who is broken and flawed, then that's what they get. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I always say, you know, men are the way they are because women fuck them. <laughs> you know, if, if yeah. women didn't, if women did not, you know, reproduce with these men that, you know, and it's, it's always after a breakup where a woman will call, then call the man an asshole. Well, he was perfectly fine when, you know, you were all happy, but, but, you know, the relationship broke up. So now he's an asshole. It's not just that it didn't work out. He's a bad guy. <laughs> I, uh, 
Yeah, no, I think I think women actually that I think that that's actually an instinctive behavior on the part of women that I and I, I do think that even if um, even if we had sort of uh, very, very if we had parity in family court. Right. So if there was sort of a a situation in which, you know, uh, all other things being equal, men were just as likely to get custody as women um, type thing. Right which we don't, but if we did, I still think that women would be the primary parental alienators because uh, women seem to, uh, who was it, Stardusk? He cited the war brides, um, you know, war brides in France, right? So French women who uh, collaborated and, and had sexual relationships with uh, the Nazi occupiers, right? If um, if you're if you're gonna do that, right? Then uh, then what ends up happening is you you don't want the inconvenience of the father of your children, uh, you know, showing up every two weeks at the door to pick them up for uh, you know a weekend with dad. Um, you know, you, you're just not gonna you're not gonna want that. You're gonna want to leave that it. Blithering genius, who is um, he, he's quite the uh, quite the interesting character on YouTube, but he did a reading of um, a memoir that was written on behalf of a Brazilian girl who was kidnapped by um, one of those uh, sort of barely being contacted by modern humans hunter gatherer tribes as a child, and and she was describing. Um, a scene in which, uh, scene from her life, um, as a captive, she was absorbed into this tribe and, uh, and the, I forget what her tribe was named. The other ones were called the Karawateri because she kept referring to them. Um, but she is describing this scene where the enemy tribe, the Karawateri, uh, are, invading and and they are essentially killing all of the men all of the boys and all of the girls under age maybe eight or nine right and uh, the boys are trying to escape and they're they're calling out to these uh the invading tribe uh the attacking tribe calling out to the men saying uh, you're my father, don't you remember, uh, you know, when you attacked us before and you impregnated my mother and, and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, because it's, it's a way of surviving. If you can, if you can sort of prove paternity in that incredibly violent situation, if you can, if you can convince a man that, yeah, you're his biological son, um, maybe he'll let you live. Um, and, uh, and the, one of the most, telling things about this this particular uh, situation was that a bunch of the women hid in a cave with their children and uh, and you know some were deeper in the cave than others and uh, the enemies came in and brought one or two of the women out uh, who had they'd seen fleeing into the cave they didn't realize there were other women and children in the cave and uh, and the women who were pulled out, uh, they totally turned state's evidence on the women who were hiding in the cave. They were like, don't you realize that there are more women in that cave and more children? And so they pulled, they went in back into the cave and they pulled all of them out and, uh, you know, killed the children and then took all of the women captive. And it's just like, it, it really is like, you know, kind of like this thing, like, an instinct on the part of women who have, you know, who have moved on from the prior situation, right? To do everything in their power to make the new situation as trouble-free as possible, right? And uh, and to completely let go of the old situation. So it, it there is kind of a thing. There is kind of a an ancient wisdom in this idea that you. You know, you don't just take out the men, you take out their sons too, because it's their sons who will avenge them, right? Their women and their daughters will just integrate themselves into their new situation and kiss the old one goodbye because that's an inconvenience. Um, 
that that is that is a a problem that they do not need to deal with and uh so i'm i'm thinking that this idea that he's an asshole right and uh, and therefore i need to socially annihilate him within our pre our, our group of of previously mutual friends i need to socially annihilate him there right so that he is no longer part of my life in any meaningful way because that's going to make things easier easier for me moving forward right i think that's a huge huge thing that has come from a uh, uh a history a, a long history hundreds of thousands of years if not more of tribal violence um that saw women seeking various survival strategies that uh that don't necessarily look honorable to men Well, it's not like that. Yeah, well, it was. This feeling. They can't, they it's can't hear like me. That. Sorry. Uh, my, my OBS was muted. Um, but yeah, no, this, this is definitely something that needs to be addressed as one of those, uh, dead instincts not dead as in we don't have it anymore but dead as in it's not actually it uh yeah, it doesn't serve a purpose anymore even maladaptive if the purpose the before was bad it's worse now yeah well i mean the purpose before i mean you could see the the i guess the the utility of it of that instinct right because it you know like it's kind of like the utility of uh, infanticide by you know mothers and uh, and males, right? Um, you, you see competitive infanticide all you know among uh, males, adult males all through the animal kingdom, right? Uh, lions do it, gorillas do it, you know all, all kinds of animals do it, uh, chimpanzees, right? Uh, a male takes over. And uh, what does he want to have happen? He wants he wants to get his shot at reproducing. He knows he's got a limited amount of time, and he's not going to wait for these infants to become juveniles and then adults, and you know, for these females that he's now in charge of to come into estrus and 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 provide him with offspring. No, he's going to kill all of these infants and juveniles, and and uh, and then the females are all going to go into heat and into estrus and then he's going to have his kids right and that's it's like it's brutal and it's awful right when and it's also at... it's also in existence throughout nature it's it's what cats do it's what a lot of different species do um yes. but i mean yes. so Wait, is fight all... or flight right fight or flight is pretty much the most basic instinct uh and and pretty much anything that moves has it and there's yet, fight, flight, or freeze. Or freeze, there's, right? But yeah, in our rabbit, society, yeah. we have uh, we've developed a set of social norms that your fight or flight, you have to have some control over your your reaction to the manifestation of that instinct. And, yeah, and I agree. I agree, but I also wanted to say, like, you know, in terms of the patterns of infanticide in the animal kingdom. Well, you look at the the infanticide in the animal kingdom that's committed by mothers. Right, and it's this is a lean season, um, and uh, and this child is going to cost me more than I can afford, and uh, I might as well just live to reproduce another day. So I'm going to just leave it in the forest and wander off, and uh, and let it die. And you see that in in women, right? You see you see that in patterns of uh, infant murder and child murder in humans. You see that m biological mothers are the most likely to commit infanticide uh, of newborn babies. Usually they're young, they're unprepared, they didn't want to have a baby, they don't, they don't feel like they can take care of it, whatever, they, they have psychological problems, all of those things, they kill their babies, right? You look at it's who, who is more likely among men to kill their children? Mother's new boyfriend or the stepdad, not the biological father. Right, so you see these patterns repeating themselves, and we can look at them in terms of, 
biological patterns that occur across species. Oh my God, dog, I'm going to kill you. Um, but you, you look at them and, and you think, well, nobody wants to even look at the fact that there might actually be an instinctive pattern of behavior, a, a predisposition or a uh, propensity here that is locked into our biology in terms of the motivations for doing X bad thing, right? Nobody wants to look at that. Right. And the fact that like that doesn't mean none of that means that we cannot have a culture in which those things are minimized to the point of almost not existing, where we have a culture where, you know, people are all essentially taught or uh, raised in such a way that they're not going to do that or not going to feel like they have to do that or whatever, um, you know, where those instincts are never going to come out. But the instincts are still there. And I think that, you know, when you look at the the similarity and patterns of male versus female infanticide in the animal kingdom versus humans, you're looking at you're looking at something that's a biological pattern that, you know, we need to looking at the root of the pattern might help us prevent it from happening. But and teaching, when we teaching deflect everybody, teaching everybody that women are always victims and no never responsible for their actions and men are always the root cause of all evil and they're brutal and vicious um you know at heart th that doesn't do anything doesn't right. do anything when we def deflect to rhetoric and dogma we we lose track of reality and we lose track of what actually can be addressed um the other thing is we're in a we're we're in a situation now where it's generational, right? We've got, what, three generations, um, especially if you uh, consider kids on, on welfare having kids at younger ages. Teen parenthood is more common um, in single-parent welfare-dependent homes than it is in two-parent middle-class and upper um, and because they're in, a, they're in a better situation to prevent it they're in a better situation to have the mentors and counseling that they need from their own family to to uh, take more responsibility for their own uh, uh, reproductive health and their own reproductive patterns and everything um, so you have uh, kids in a better situation are less likely to get in that situation uh, but uh, then then what happens they they raise their family on welfare in a single parent home and the next generation does the same thing and so on and we've actually eliminated male mentorship from little boys lives to the point where they leave their single mother's home and they go to an elementary school that is run almost entirely by women often there's even a woman principal they, they've eliminated men almost entirely from the elementary school system. You're lucky if there's a male janitor. Um, their entire uh, uh, day is pretty much governed by uh, female control and female rules and female sensibilities, the ones that they're naturally uh, bound to, con uh, to, to uh, uh, conform to, basically, um, to accommodate. And even in terms of, uh, you know, the lessons that they're going to learn in school, the rules that are going to apply to them versus the rules that are going to apply to girls, the media that they're exposed to, which emphasizes everything on TV right now is about girl power and raising girls up, lifting girls up and everything. Um, and, and the foil for that, of course, is the bad guy, the deadbeat man, the dumb man, the clueless man the bumbling father, um, you know, or the, the white knight that has to protect, you know, the rare white knight that has to protect all of the, the girl power from all of those bad guys. And there, but don't expect there's a kiss from Maiden because this isn't right. Mario Princess Peach. And if, even if it was, that would be misogynist, right? Right. And it's, it's just, um, uh, a situation where, where do these boys turn to decide who and what they're going to be when they grow up. Where do they turn to decide what a man is if all they have to look at is the vast majority, overwhelming majority of men 
are all of these bad stereotypes and the only good stereotype is the one whose job it is to manage all the bad men where do they yeah. have to go with that and what does that do to like psychologically every time you fuck up right every time you have a situation in your life where something you did has displeased the gods right something you did has displeased your mother your teacher one of the girls in your class who's being uplifted at your expense um, anything that you think or feel that you see demonized in, in television movies music you're not even allowed to decide what kind of butt you like to look at you know or whether or not you like to look at it uh, and and what happens to your psychological development as you grow up you either learn that you're a monster or you learn that in order to not be a monster you have to be monstrous toward other men well and I think I think too you know when you're when you're looking at it uh, in terms of the you know there are some demons that are not going to be tamed and i think that a lot of those demons end up being really 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 attracted to the feminist narrative right i think that you know there are bad men out there and i know that there are bad men out there um and uh, just like there are bad women and i think that a lot of these men who are predatory who are sociopathic who are antisocial who are any number of things right they are really like hugo schweitzer was really attracted to the feminist narrative, right? Because what's the feminist narrative? That women are at your mercy, right? That it is only your restraint that allows women to exist and not be subjugated and oppressed, right? It is only your your mag magnanimousness, right? Magnanimity um, in terms of uh, allowing women the freedom, right? Because you... As a man, you are in a position of privilege. You are you are stronger and more powerful. You have more clout in society. You are privileged, right? And therefore, it is only your magnanimity that uh, that allows women to flourish, to be strong, to be to to have girl power, all of those things, right? And that that's got to be a very very seductive narrative for men who actually do see women as subordinate or do see women as inferior um, or who do want to control women, uh, who do want to have, uh, you know, uh, control over them and their behavior and want to sexually exploit them and all of those things, right? So that's when you come into situations where, um, you know, Alexander Kolpakov, uh, Russian Deadpool, you know, yeah. for every, uh, from everything that I could gather, from all of the information that was posted about that incident, right, of him shooting his girlfriend, it was because he had he had been in a polyamorous polyamorous relationship with uh, two women, uh, and then had just brought a third one in, so he had his harem, and uh, he was not reciprocal in his acceptance of polyamory the other way around he did not like that any of the women with him had any male friends let alone male boyfriends um was not interested in that so he really had a harem going and uh and then uh from what i heard from someone close to them uh he presented her with a ring on heather uh heather um god uh heather annable um he presented her with a ring and asked her to i guess be his uh his um head harem woman i guess the 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 one he really cares about and she'd been thinking about leaving him for quite a while because he was controlling and uh and i'm guessing uh because that was the last that uh, anybody knows is that he presented her with the ring and uh, asked her to uh to commit for life to the arrangement 
And uh, then next thing anybody knew, he'd shot her twice in the chest in the, the parking lot outside their home. And uh, I'm guessing she, essentially, that was that was the thing that made her actually say, no, I'm actually going to leave you. I don't want to be part of this anymore. That That's what I imagine probably happened. Um, but he was, he was such an ardent, adamant feminist, I guess, that he would threaten uh, any anti-feminist to come fight him in real life. And, you know, if you're not a feminist, you're a piece of shit. And, and he'd go on these, like, spectacular rants about how anybody who isn't a feminist is, is, he hates women and, and wants to treat women like shit and wants to rape and kill women. And, and then look what he did, right? And all I'm thinking is, well, you found the narrative that suited your personality and you thought that, okay, well, I'm, I'm like that, but hey, with feminism, maybe I don't have to be like that. Maybe, I don't know. Or maybe you were more predatory and said, hey, this narrative exposes me to women who are vulnerable. You know, it can be consciously one thing and subconsciously the other. The mysteries of the toxic masculinity Avenger are uh, deep and wide. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's... All I, know, all I know is there is no shortage of male feminists, the ones who are often the most strident and, and vitriolic and hostile in their communications with anti-feminists, particularly female anti-feminists, right? Who have been, you know, brought up on charges of feeling up a woman who was passed out at a party and taking pictures of it. Uh, that would be Kyle Payne. Um, luring, try, attempting to lure a 15-year-old into, into a sexual liaison online. That would be Hannibal the Victor 13, right? Um, there's any number of gamer gators who have been exposed as, as you being... You anti-gamer gators? Sorry, anti-gamer anti gators who have been ex exposed as being creep lords, uh, being charged with, with various offenses and stuff, right? And uh, that's not to say that that feminism made them do it. I don't think feminism made them do it. I think that essentially it's a matter of um, feminism's narrative attracting certain types of male right. predators. The toxic, I think the toxic masculinity narrative, in addition to doing damage to a lot of guys where it makes them unable to find a role in their lives, it also provides a cover for... Uh, those among men who are predatory and violent. And, like, there are things that provide a cover for the women that are like that. Uh, and feminism has narratives that provides cover for violent women. Very, very much so. Um, and, and, of course, with everything not being women's fault in the feminist narrative, it, it's very convenient for, for women who are violent and predatory. Um, but I think the same narrative that feminists use to demonize men does provide a cover for for men who really are the way feminists describe all men as being because they can just turn around and say well no it wasn't it wasn't my fault it was it was the toxic masculinity uh, it was and, society. yeah it was society and the hegemony of masculinity and raywin connell told me this isn't my fault right um uh, yeah yeah because because society is taught me to be this way and uh, so how else could I be expected to be exactly yeah. exactly and that to me that tells tells the individual you know it's it, here's here's a uh, scapegoat here's a uh, an excuse here's a way to say well I'm not a bad person just because I do bad things um, but it doesn't always necessarily give them uh, a pathway to to improve either it more or less gives them a pathway to continue to be that person uh, it Maybe. doesn't there's no self-examination in it there's no accountability in it so there's no uh, how do I not be this other than well I just have to see these things as abnormal and seeing these things as abnormal might work for guys who are already not like that but it's not going to work for a guy who has developed that level of dysfunction, who has grown up uh, not learning uh, 
uh, accountability and not learning to uh, value other people as as he values himself and things like that. When you have somebody who's damaged that way, and I think most people who end up in that situation, if they're not biologically from birth or whatever, a psychopath or a sociopath, that does come from damage growing up, a one way oh, yeah. or another. But if they're yeah. in that, 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 that point where they've hit that level of damage, they don't have a pathway out of it. No. There's just no way for them to fix themselves, at least not not with the narrative that they've chosen, because the narrative that they've chosen is just, uh, this was done to you, and and it's not your fault, and, and uh, you know, as long as you act as a mouthpiece for us, you know, all is forgiven, and and uh, and there you go, I, that, like that. And one of the one of the weirdest things too, right? And I'm starting to get more and more sympathetic with you know, turfs and and super rad fems, um, on this particular certain certain particular issues, right? Specific issues is you know like you you had a bunch of really radical feminists sounding the alarm over Hugo Schweitzer way early on, way, 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 way before his meltdown, right? Saying like, this, this is like not, a, this guy is not okay, right? And, uh, you know, like I, I have to give it to them in the sense that, yeah, no, his, none of his behavior uh, throughout, like they would say it's all, you know, it's not okay because he victimized women. I would say it's not okay because he victimized men. He victimized that that male student who came to him after a, after what would under uh, a non double standard uh, type of um, viewpoint uh, would have been you know I was raped what do I do and he said no 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 it wasn't rape it wasn't rape you know like no no and and you're you're fine um, he he had apparently had a child with a woman who decided to stay with the man she was with. He was cheating with her and and she decided to lie to her husband and, and say, yeah, this is your kid and, and he just let that go and, you know, felt guilty about it and gave himself uh, 20 lashes on the yeah. back and uh, and then, then he's done with that. That's like he's atoned, and and it's all good. We're all it's blank slate now. We're we're working from a clean slate. And like, I'm sorry, but you don't get to like go through your life being an an element of chaos, right? Destroying the lives of other people, and then say, well, it was it was masculinity that done did it. it wasn't me. Yeah. And it's it's actually the toxic masculinity narrative and the anti slut shaming the feminist anti slut shaming narrative both have a thing in common. Uh, the feminist anti slut shaming narrative leaves men no way to differentiate men and boys to differentiate between women uh, in the dating pool who who simply have for previous sex partners versus women in the dating pool who are disloyal and dishonest and cheat on their boyfriends and choose sex partners that are maybe not the best idea to sleep with and don't take any uh, care to uh, control their own reproduction even though they have a multitude of ways available to do that well, uh, you know same, well you have the same thing same. with the toxic masculinity narrative in that you have fewer tools since all men are supposed to be um, supposedly, according to this toxic men masculinity narrative, all men are in infected with characteristics that feminists describe as always bad. And then, then the girl has no way to differentiate among guys in the dating pool between those who are, uh, you know, rugged and uh, independent from female control and who uh, have a healthy level of self-interest and, and who have a healthy level of being protective of their, their loved ones the way men are versus guys who are controlling violent predatory assholes. And like regular feminists, the, the nice feminists, the feminists who are not like that are going to be the most vulnerable ones to the, that end of you know to, to guys who really are toxic you know just like 
guys who listen to the feminist narrative on slut shaming are going to be vulnerable to women who really are toxic. They're not just going to not judge women for their choices prior to having met him. They're going to not vet women for character when those choices genuinely are dysfunctional. And it's not just, you know, she has ex-boyfriends and, and she's a serial monogamist, um, you know, or, or anything along those lines. Oh, I love, I love that one article. I don't know if you guys all read it, but there was that one article about the guy who's like, I'm lying in bed, you know, and uh, my wife comes in and she snuggles up to me and tells me about the guy she just had sex with tonight. And I'm, I don't feel any jealousy. You know, I understand she's just exploring, you know, her sexuality and and, you know, we have an open relationship and I don't have as much opportunity to, you know, do the same thing, mostly because I'm at home looking after our kid while she's out on dates, but uh, also because it's harder for men to get laid than it is for women. Um, and, uh, you know, and this is my life and I love it. I, honest, honest, I do. I love my life and I, I support my wife in her exploration of her sexuality with other men. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my fucking God, like this is, this is, this is not the, you know, like there are some men out there who are like, I want to see my wife banged by another man. Right. And that's what turns me on. And, and you know, if his wife's into that, that's cool. Right. Um, but this, this is a guy who's like trying to explain to himself that he's okay with his wife having sex with other men while he sits at home looking after their kid, right? And and I'm just like, that doesn't sound like, that sounds like a man who's trying to convince himself, right? That this is okay. It doesn't sound like a man who's okay with it. It sounds like a man who's trying to convince himself that it's okay. And you know, but he, he's, he's a good feminist and, you know, women deserve to have their sexual freedom. And even though it, under patriarchal societies, actual patriarchal societies, both men and women are su expected to be faithful within marriage. <sighs> we need to really look at it and, uh, and, and allow the women their freedom to explore their sexuality, which has been suppressed for so long, never mind the fact that in the 1920s you could buy anti-masturbation devices for your eight-year-old boy from freaking Sears and Roebuck. Well, and, so. and actually circumcision, the, the act of, of cutting off part of a baby's genitals at, at birth or shortly thereafter without anesthetic was popularized as a means of preventing boys from masturbating. I mean, yeah, can I mean, you get more uh, yeah. hateful toward male sexuality than that? A means of preventing boys from uh, masturbating and a means of uh, quieting the male sexual organ um, because the only appropriate uh, equation for sex was penis plus vagina equals baby. Um, among those people at that time. And so essentially, um, you know, and John Harvey Kellogg, uh, he didn't just recommend circumcision for boys. He recommended clitoridectomy for girls. He also recommended, uh, if you weren't willing to go that far, um, recommended burning the clitoris with carbolic acid to scar it up and make it less sensitive. Right to uh, eliminate sexual impulse in both men and women, so he was like completely anti-sex. Um, and uh, wouldn't you know it, uh, the the girl stuff didn't catch on. Right, the the only stuff that became so popular that uh, at one point about ninety percent of men in the United States were being circumcised. Um, that was that was all you know. Uh, the the male aspect of things. Let's tame male sexuality. Let's let's de uh, let's depathologize male sexuality. Let's um, cure male sexuality. Uh, well, I think that's really interesting. Though we also talk about rape culture as a artifact of maleness. 
Well, completely ignoring um, the romance novels, etc., and the Fifty Shades of Grey esque type stuff that uh, have women uh, be, you know, predated upon as something that women like. So that's just really confusing. Oh, it I mean, is. You know, I was in the romance writers community for you know four, three, four years. Um, and I, I did a lot of research into, you know, what's permissible and what's not and all of those things and what certain publishers permit and what they don't. And one of the, the, the ways that they got around the Sweet Savage Love and uh, the Kathleen Woodowis uh, novels of the 1970s and 80s, um, you know, uh, Rosemary Rogers and Kathleen Woodowis, uh, where, where you literally had, and there were others, right? where you literally had a situation where at the start of the book, the, the hero rapes the heroine and it is not a gray rape. It is not a, mm, there's, there's context and, and nuance here rape. No, it was a brutal rape. It, it left her traumatized. And then after the course of 300 pages of a book, he convinced her, well, if you knew me now, then the way you know me now, you would have consented. And then it's all, it's all fine. It's all fine. Right. And women were getting the women were rubbing themselves off to this shit. Right. In the 70s and 80s. And then in the 90s and a little bit later that those that trope, that particular trope, the genuine rape trope became it started to be pushed out of the genre. Right. Of the genre of mainstream romance. <laughs> right. And uh, and where where did it go? It was pushed down to more heavily eroticized uh, subgenres of romantic and erotic fiction that uh, that have things that capture romance and and ambiguous consent and all of this stuff. My publisher they had a strict rule that uh, if there you couldn't write a rape scene and make it erotic. You couldn't you couldn't write an erotic rape scene. Uh, you could write a violent rape scene uh, that was uh, presented as abhorrent and, and awful, um, but if it was going to be a genuine rape, it could not be eroticized. And uh, if you had something rapey you wanted to do with your book, you just had to make sure that in the privacy of the heroine's own thoughts, without necessarily telling the hero one millisecond before he penetrated her, she was like, yes, I actually do want this. And uh, and then it became suddenly not rape, even though in the hero's mind, he was raping her, right? Because she never told, she, she, she never told him yes. She told him no, fought, struggled, you know, all of this stuff, right? Um, and, uh, and resisted him and, and then uh, decided in her own mind to just let him do it, and uh, and then he did it, and in his mind he's a rapist, and that's okay, right? And, and not only okay, it's hot. Oh my God, it's hot, right? So I'm just like I'm looking at this and going like, and people think men have difficulty with consent, right? You even had you even had romance novels where, uh usually in the historical romance context, right? Where, where you had a, a woman who, who all but forced a man to have sex with her, right? And he was like, no, 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 we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't do this. And he, she was like, no, I want this. I want this. And then they do it. And then the next morning she's fucking pissed off at him because he took advantage of her. So on because, one hand, you have stealth consenting, but on the other hand, his refusal doesn't matter. And no, and even he, if he, even if uh, she he, wants he the sex, yes. he's at fault. He took her yes answer, but he should have been able to read her mind or be clairvoyant and 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 predict the future and understand that in the morning, in the context of the sun coming up the next morning, she would regret it and so he should have continued to resist you know um even though uh she told him over and over and over again this is what i really want like like i'm looking at you laverl spencer right that that's a trope you used a whole bunch of times but i mean we're looking at these tropes from like really popular romance authors right you know, and then Fifty Shades of Grey, that's just fucking topping from the bottom, Anna. 
That's just topping from the fucking bottom. She's in charge of the whole fucking relationship because he's devoted to her. I see that so often in like BDSM couples, uh, etc. It's pretty funny. Oh yeah, no. And so it's essentially like what you're looking at is this this thing where consent is is a consent is a function of a woman's state of mind at any given moment during the event or for 30 years or 40 years after the event during that entire time she has the ability right like i'm i'm literally reading an article on Jezebel right and she's like yeah uh, the man i married you know the first time we had sex he raped me and she's like i'm serious he raped me because I had so much to drink that I couldn't have consented. But when I woke up in the morning, I was like, hey, this is actually kind of cool. I like this guy next to me in bed. And so then we started dating and he did everything that I wanted. You know, he, he, he answered my texts and he called me again and he, we dated more. And, and uh, therefore, uh, even though it was rape, uh, we got married and we lived happily ever after. And I'm like... How can you feminists think that it's men who have a problem with defining consent? How can you think that? Because this woman, right, she literally said, I could not have consented. I was so drunk, I could not have consented. But I was happy with the outcome, and so therefore, I retroactively consented. I, well, retro I retroactively me essentially made it so that he didn't actually commit a crime against me. Exactly. And that's the thing. Just because she doesn't, she, she was blackout drunk. Just because she doesn't remember consenting doesn't mean that she didn't say yes at the time. Now, I understand legally because, you know, she was drunk, then the law could consider that rape. But, um, and, and I think that goes a lot to her behavior afterwards because it wasn't that she was uh, appalled at the idea of having sex with this man it's just that she didn't remember actually consenting yeah but if she had woken up next to ron jeremy's uglier less famous <laughs> cousin we all know how it would have played out well exactly we all exactly. know what would have happened she would have been like holy fuck i was raped and gone to the police station right, right. well she, she was because he was the captain of the football team and he was really right. good looking and he was really nice and he answered her texts and, mm -hmm. and you know, cooked her breakfast and, and wanted to date her and like really wanted to commit with her and stuff like But at any point in that timeline between then and the marriage, right, she could have said if he had done something that she didn't want him to do, like essentially just, I don't know, start dating somebody else or tell her to hit the road or or not cook her breakfast or or whatever right if he had done something to annoy her she would have just been able to go to the police and say yeah he raped me mm -hmm. right and and it's like okay so i'm sorry but like you this this like the idea that just because i don't mind that somebody committed a crime against me means it wasn't a crime like that's not a, that's not a concept under the law nope it's especially only a concept with, in the feminist mind especially with criminal law because in under criminal law like you know the torts right civil court that's one person saying that another person wronged me right but criminal court is saying this person wronged all it this person affronted all of society the, the the victim is not the plaintiff in a criminal case the plaintiff is the people the plaintiff is the crown or the representative of the people it is the people right who have been transgressed not the victim right yes the victim is the victim but the transgression under the legal uh structure is that the transgression has been made against the people that the, the offense is so egregious that all people are victims of it Right. And therefore, all people are the plaintiff in the case. Right. That that's how that works. Right. That 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 person violated society's morals, not violated that single person's morals. Holy shit. This is a great legal argument for all kinds of shit. Um, 
that that you sorry got got I, I had a light bulb moment there and then I just kind of had a brain fart but um but essentially the criminal law right is agreed upon by all of us right that this these offenses are so egregious that even if a person is not even if the victim says they don't feel harmed by the offense the rest of society is so outraged by that offense that they are willing to prosecute that that's what criminal statutes exist for right it's not because you're transgressing some individual person's boundaries or standards or or whatever it's because you're you're transgressing society's standards and boundaries or at least society's rules for what constitute individual boundaries it's it's supposedly we have these laws in place so that we are able to maintain order in our society and prevent uh, yeah. the the chaos of people just offending against each other and getting revenge for each, against each offense and just having it escalate out of control. Uh, yeah, or having or having a bunch of women saying, "Well, you raped me, uh, but hey, sure, let's get married, um, and you you don't need to be prosecuted or reported or go to jail because hey." But the next guy who does the exact fucking same thing with a different woman, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, he he doesn't know whether he's transgressed, right? Until she tells him. Yep. Um, I'm gonna take us into the super chats because it's uh it's getting up there, um, and also there's one we probably are gonna take some time to talk about, so I want to get him before it gets too late. Um, Darth Sonic, uh, says, I can't help, I gave us $10 and says, I can't help but think a lot of my sexuality is a response to hearing that my gender is full of evil, sadistic rapists. Why not exclusively seek women, or who wanted to be dominated, uh, uh, by a creature like that? And then he goes on to say, to follow up my last chat, safe, sane, and consensual people don't want what I said to be misinterpreted. So it sounds like um, a, a statement on maybe being a dom? I don't know. Um, but, uh, like yeah. yeah. And I, I, I kind of wondered about that. Um, you have all kinds of reasons behind, like, I know some of the most passive people in public are the ones that you find out, yeah, this is a, this is a dom. Uh, and some of the most, um, not necessarily aggressive, but self-assertive and self-assured. And uh, the person who, who walks into a room and sort of takes responsibility for everything or takes control of everything, it turns out to be the one who, who is uh, a, the submissive in those in a lot of those relationships. So I think a lot of times it's um relief from the person that you are in a in a situation where responsibility is to be had or where um uh basically somebody has to take control uh and and decide what's going to happen for the rest of the group or or how the rest of the group is going to handle things. Um can but, confirm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can confirm. <laughs> But I can also see, like, um, I, yeah, if you're told that if you're told that uh, you know men are men are uh, rapey bastards that just want to control women, uh, and and you grow up thinking this is this is the thing that I have to fight all the time, it might be a relief to run into a submissive, and just have that that relationship. Uh, but going on to the one I think we're probably going to spend some time on is uh, Apollo the Leader gave us $15 and said, uh, just because, uh, and I can't tell what kind of face that is because it's not showing up well in this, but oh, by the way, I'm about uh, 30 minutes behind in the stream. Did you guys talk about the Johnny Depp Amber Heard situation? Hashtag believe women. A and little bit. Barely. Not on this show much, though. But that situation is a hell of a situation because now that it's coming out, like, there were clues before, um, the, the stuff that she had said prior, uh, and the fact that she faked, uh, injury, and was, was using public opinion as a battering ram against him, kind of, I wondered about whether she was maybe an abusive person. 
when I watched when I watched that uh, that video that she uh, took on her camera, right, right, and she it was it was very much mm -hmm. like I'm going to start recording because you know you're behaving erratically, right? It just it threw me back into this situation where, you know, I had a friend she married a guy down in the states, moved down there, yeah. he, you know, he promptly shut up, dog. He promptly got her pregnant, um, and uh, but after six months of being married, he hadn't yet even filled out the paperwork to sponsor her, yeah. right? And he was uh, very controlling. She had run out, all of her savings had run out. Her bank account was empty, um, and uh, he would not allow her access to the finances, would not... Uh, put money in her bank account, would not give her money. She had no driver's license, right? She was just in a situation with her four-year-old boy um, and pregnant where he had control over everything. And then one night, I, uh, she, well, she called me at about four in the afternoon and, uh, and I stayed on the line with her. Uh, she was talking with me on the phone, pretended to hang up when he came home right put her phone in her back pocket and then during the periods of time where you know she could actually get into a room away from him uh she would plug her phone in and keep charging it and i listened to that for 11 hours i listened to a man gaslight a woman for 11 freaking solid hours before she finally flipped her shit made a threat a verbal threat which I'm sure he recorded and then he called police to tell them that his wife had threatened to kill him and uh, and like I this this was like it was unbelievable because it was completely out of character for her right to like she's she's been one of the strongest people that I have ever known right and she was just a blubbering mess for 11 freaking hours right begging him to stop he keeps telling her she's crazy he, she's the one with the problem uh then tells her shit like she's like please go get me some cigarettes right she's like she's been quit smoking for ages but he's stressing her out so much she's like please go get me some cigarettes he says go get yourself some cigarettes she's like it's four miles he says you can walk she says i don't have any money he says there's money in the car she says the car's locked can i have the keys to the car to get the money he says no right? No, you can't. And then she says, so can you get me some cigarettes? And he says, get them yourself. Right? And round and around and around we go, right? And he's telling her she's being crazy. And he's just like, and then the moment that she really flips out and says something atrocious, that's when he's on the phone to the cops and saying, she's approaching me, please get here right away. Right? I'm listening to all this, and I'm like, what the fuck? Right? And the police come, and they interview her and him and the, the four-year-old, and they all tell the same story, and, you know, essentially, like, at least in terms of the threat, right? And they tell him to go sleep on a friend's couch for the night and hand her a bunch of pa pamphlets for battered women's shelters and says, best thing you can do is leave the country. And she's like, I can't leave the country. I have no money, right? And he's he hasn't sponsored like and we thought we initially we thought at the time and it was confirmed over the course of the next several months that what he wanted was he wanted a kid and not a wife. So he was planning on having her have the baby in the United States and then uh having her deported as an illegal at which point the kid stays and she goes and she can't come back for 10 years and that's that, right? And so I'm looking at this Johnny Depp thing and I'm thinking, is what she showed on the camera just the last 15 minutes of the 11 hours that I listened to? It's is that possible. What? Yeah, because, you know, like, because I've, like, there are abusive women out there, there are abusive men out there and, and, this guy, he said to me when he was, uh, when I finally told him that, no, I'm not a comrade in arms. I'm not just one of your, uh, one of those 
the people who's friendly with you who just happen to fall in the path of this crazy woman who's obviously mm -hmm. crazy, right? Which is what he was trying to convince me of. You and I both know what she's like, right? And I'm like, yeah, I know. I know exactly what she's like. Mm -hmm. You're fucking psycho. And then he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm an expert at mind fucking people. And I'll mind fuck the judge too, right? Is is essentially what he said to me. Um, so it's like I, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, is is this what Amber Heard is? Is this what she did to him, to Johnny Depp? Because like my friend was like, she was completely back to front psycholog psychologically. She was like a, an absolute fucking mess after six months with this guy, right? An absolute fucking nightmarish mess. Um, I went down, I drove down to the US, I drove two fucking days and picked her up and brought her home. And, uh, and, but it was just like, she was, she was just a complete fucking wreck for weeks. Right. Before I finally, you know, and I didn't even talk her into it. I just listened to her talk and then she talked herself out of the, out of the, the, I guess the brainwashing or whatever the fuck it was that he had her convinced of, but she would call me and she'd say, Oh, he, she would, she would call me one night and be like, Oh, he's been like, he's been horrible. And then the next day she'd call me, Oh, it's okay. He bought me a kitten. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. He bought you a you he bought you a kitten? Like what the hell? And then I'd get on the phone with him, I'd be like, I just want to know both sides of the story because like I, I can't I can't just go by one side of the story. I need to know what's going on. And he says, You shouldn't be talking to me. You're supposed to be on her side. This is a sides thing. Yeah, that this, sounds like a controlling asshole. Side, this is a my side, her side thing, and so, you know. And, and I'm like, uh, that's actually not how I see it. Like, I'd actually really like to help you guys if I can help you, right? Uh, work out your problems, right? Like, that, that's what I'd like to see. I don't, want, I don't want to see either of you, you know, in trouble or having problems or hurt or anything, right? I just want to know what's going on. I'm here in Canada. You're down in freaking Idaho. And... Uh, yeah, no, he, he just was like, no, you shouldn't be talking to me because you're supposed to be on her side and and uh, I have people on my side and so we've got our sides and and I was just like, oh my fucking, like what, what kind of fucking psycho is this? So, yeah. Well, yeah. It sounds so teenager, like high school drama, <laughs> but with like yeah, real well, stakes. That's well, so weird. Know, here's the thing, right? He'd had two long-term girlfriends that he'd gotten pregnant and both of them had an abortion after they broke up with him. So that they would never have to deal with him again. Yeah, I, I'm guessing that, uh, you know, if he, oh, he behaves that with one, he's, he, well, he's the same thing as, uh, you know, the gal from the Seven Years in Hell story. Um, all of oh, this yeah. stuff that she pulled on my friend, she pulled on the next guy, too. And, oh, uh, yeah. It started with, there was, at one point, she had him trapped in an upper story room of, a, of the building they were in. And he was afraid to go out the window because he was afraid he would get hurt more going out the window than he would get hurt confronting her. And, uh, you know, for those that don't know, this isn't, you know, a petite little five foot nothing cutesy little gal. You know, she's, she's, she's not an anime princess. She is taller than me. I'm five foot nine. She's enough taller than me that it's obvious when I, you know, got it to a situation where I couldn't keep uh, distance from her because they were moving past us. Her and her little entourage were moving past us. Um, she was enough taller than me that I had to look up at her. She was bigger in the shoulders, broader in the shoulders. She was slightly overweight, but she was not. Uh, soft she was she had muscle and uh, so this is not you know a, a situation where he was afraid of you know like turning his ankle or something he was afraid of real serious he, damage but there she is in the room throwing things at him you know household objects knickknacks uh, you know stuff you would keep on a desk whatever and all of he all he did was brush past her 
on his way out the door. No injury, no bruising, no nothing. 18 months in jail. Because oh. both of them were able to describe him as having forced his way past her to get out of the room. And even though she was throwing things at him, he was considered the aggressive one because he's the guy. Um, oh, my like she was even able to convince him. They convinced him, She between her and the state, they convinced him that he had been abusive to do that instead of listening to whatever it was she wanted to tell him that she was angry about. Oh, my God. Like, this this is really what, what it boils down to is, like, um, you know, like, this this guy, I, I was, like, I was so happy that the police were... Um, were helpful to my friend, right? And you know it, that they that they got him out of the house, and and you know like then I essentially told her, well, you know I'm leaving in the morning to come get you, right? And uh, I will drag you out of that house by your hair if I need to, right? Like I'm I'm not leaving you there, right? Um, and I don't care whether he buys you a kitten, right? In the interim. Because that's not going to matter. We'll bring a kitten across the border. It'll it'll be fine, right? But um, but essentially, like I, you know, like there are people who can who can fuck you up so bad mentally that you don't know your freaking head from your arse. You don't know up from down. You don't know. Uh, you, you're questioning your own sanity, right? And uh, and it, it's. I think that we we don't. I think that you know honestly in terms of in terms of what I would call a, an abusive relationship right there has to be an element of that there has to be an element of psychological abuse there can't only be violence um violence is you know like violence is something that kids resort to that that dogs resort to that people resort to when they're frustrated when they're angry when they don't feel um, that when they when they're pre under under intense amounts of pressure or strain, right, and and then s somebody comes up to them and and provokes them and and they push or they slap or they whatever, right? Those kinds of things, you know, those tend to be, you know, sporadic. They don't tend to be a, an ongoing pattern. They don't tend to be something that is, you know, is uh, is they're they're just like people being people, people having human failings. Right, and they they might hit when they're like just really mad in in the middle of a conflict, whatever. Right, but when you're looking at this pattern of abuse, right, that that is what Duluth is based on. What the Duluth model is based on is a pattern of coercive control and abuse, right, over the course of you know months or years. Right, it's it's not a single incident. It's it's a pattern of behavior. And that has to be accompanied by some kind of demoralization of the victim. It has to be accompanied by some kind of undermining of the victim's sense of sanity or their sense of self self worth or their sense of being uh, able to survive without the part the abusive partner. All of those things, all of those things, have to be in place for for me to consider it to be something that we really need to get. Uh, that the authorities involved in to the degree that they are involved in, right? So brushing past somebody because you want to escape a situation, I'm sorry, even if you pushed her out of the way, right? Pushed her, physically pushed her out of the way to get out of that situation, that's not abuse. It might be violence under the law, but it's not abuse. What's abuse is the pattern of behavior, right? of her throwing things at him and screaming at him and undermining him and trying to yep. undermine his sense of sanity and trying to make him think of himself as a less worthy human being and all of those things, all of them enforced by the physical aspect of her aggression, right? All of those things enforced by that, right? And that that's really what abuse is. And so like, I wanna take, I want society to take a more nuanced approach to abuse right? Um, rather than the approach that we have right now, which is if the man lays his hand on a woman, right, then he's an abuser. And no matter what the woman does, uh, barring like uh, it, putting an axe in his thigh or something like that, um, because he spilt the tea, 
uh, then she's uh, she's perfectly justified in in her abuse because it was either self defense or violent resistance. Even That's if she, a- uh, yeah, even if she shoots him and then cuts his throat and then stabs him twenty seven times, our society has difficulty holding her accountable, especially oh, yeah. if she's young and pretty. We got to get oh. out of that situation because the type of abuse that the Duluth model describes does happen and both sexes perpetrate it the motivations for that abuse it's not patriarchy the motivations for that abuse stem from the damage that the person has psychologically or in in rare occasions that person being born damaged um yeah yeah it's it's like that's that's a totally different thing and it needs a totally different approach and they will not be able to uh, address that, they're even not, that not. type of violence, much less the other ones, by yeah, no, screaming toxic not. masculinity and flinging poo at men. Yeah, even the man who, who abuses his wife in that way, right? He's not doing it because patriarchy. He's doing it because either he was beaten by his mother or sexually abused by a, a, a babysitter or or whatever, some kind of you know, or ex- exposed to some kind of extreme trauma, right? Grew or, up in a violent household. Uh, yeah, Aaron yeah. Pitsy talked about, you know, even in, like, this affects the development of the brain in the womb when you are, yes. uh, you know, when you gestate in a violent household. Um, yeah. It, you, you are born with a different psychological makeup already, a different, uh, uh, different wiring, pattern yeah. of brain chemistry, basically. Uh, than a child who is born in a loving household or even yeah, a normal or... household, just a just oh. not necessarily particularly loving, just not violent. Yeah, and you look at you look at the the situation with the born psychopath or the born sociopath, right? You know, like the the very rare instance of that. Um, you know, like the, these are kids who, like at age four, are sticking pins in the family dog's eyes, right? And they they think it's fun. So it's like, and the parents are, you know, they may have, they may have like one or two or three other perfectly normal children. And this one kid is just a complete freak. Right. And, uh, and they often have no idea how to cope with that. Um, so it's, it's like, you know, like you're looking at situations where like, it takes a lot. It doesn't take much to lash out when you're angry. Right. But it takes a lot of fucked upness. Right. To go on a campaign of terrorization and and demoralization and, you know, uh, just absolutely um, beating somebody down, beating another person down, particularly somebody that you profess to love. Right. That that takes that takes something that is not intrinsic to male nature or female nature takes something different right and uh but that that's the uh, that's the view of domestic violence that we all have that's the view of it that's in all of the public service announcements and all of that stuff all of the ads right is that form of domestic violence that that really extreme coercive control form of domestic violence that duluth says men perpetrate on women because patriarchy and because it's supposedly normalized and uh, and then we have uh, the Australian government essentially saying, well, if a boy runs past a girl and accidentally knocks her down and doesn't notice and, and so doesn't stop and say sorry, right, that means he's on the path of being that guy, that guy who, like, systematically tortures and abuses a woman over the course of years, right? Like, no, no, I'm sorry. That's... that's most people's lives are a little more complicated than that. No, exactly. I know, like one of the things that we are going to have to deal with as a movement, we have people that are willing to adopt the toxic masculinity narrative. And what I'm seeing is it's 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 constantly being used by feminists and by uh, individuals who want things to be easy, and then also by people who have something to mask to create a situation where we can't under uh, examine the underlying causes of severe dysfunction 
uh, in human in interactions and severe uh, dysfunction uh, in terms of um, psychological development, uh, and uh, particularly in, in uh, boys and men, where you know there has to be some stamp you can put on them instead. Uh, instead of looking and say, what, why is this happening? We just look at uh, what can we label this and then shove it aside. Um, and we need to be able to sort of reject, you know what, we're not going to put this stamp on this guy. We need to sort of be able to reject that and say, no, if we want to prevent this type of dysfunction, we have to look at the causes and what can be done to mitigate those causes and also what can be done to uh, assist in recovery when those causes have already happened. And it's it's hard in all of the situations. I mean, it, the hardest one is when you have somebody who has been subjected to se sexual violence as a child and they become sexually violent as an adult. In, a, in whatever of the variety of ways that a person can do that, um, you want to condemn because it, we, we have such a mental block when it comes to sexual violence. You want condemnation to be your primary response because condemnation feels righteous and good. But it doesn't prevent the next incident. It no. never has. Only examination of well, why did this happen in the first place and well, what but... can we do to prevent it from happening again. That is the only way, the only road to uh, to dealing with something like that this is what i don't understand about feminists though because they're like they'll 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 call like if if you say if you say right that um you know there's a significant uh majority right not not like a huge overwhelming majority but a significant majority of convicted male rapists right men who've raped women uh who have who report that they have a history of sexual violence in their childhood or adolescence um by women by adult women um they they will say you're making excuses <clears throat> you're making excuses but then what is the toxic masculinity narrative society made me do it right isn't yeah. that making use right so it's like so it's it's like they're happy to blame society for the things men do right as long as we don't ever single out women's behavior the behavior of all women or the behavior of certain individual women as long as we don't single that out right then we're okay with blaming other things for men's bad behavior right but how dare you how dare you suggest <coughs> that you know female predation on boys and and adolescent uh young men right might actually lead to a higher incidence of rape of women in the future right how dare you suggest that um that that's just making excuses for those guys and so it, it's it might even yeah. be more productive to discuss the fact that this is true with both sexes boys and girls who uh yeah. are are subjected to sexual violence during their childhood um there's a there's a percentage of them then that go on to uh offend as adults that is higher than the percentage of people who don't uh and it, it, i suspect there's another factor or two in there that that influences because there's there are people who are uh there there those of us that have been victimized that have not gone on to engage in any sexual violence whatsoever oh um, there's plenty and i think yeah. Like, I think the, the determining uh, thing, like, I, I think what Aaron Pitsy talked about in terms of um, the influence of violence on the developing brain has a lot to do with that. And I think it, in terms of, it, it's not just like long-term victimization, because even that doesn't necessarily lead to becoming a perpetrator as an adult. But growing up in a situation where you learn that violence is your primary means of conflict management might. Yes. Yes, that that's really like that's what I told the people at the walk a mile event that I went to with Nick Redding um, and uh, and the organizer, she approached us and, you know, we were just standing off to the side with our sandwich board and our, our literature and everything and talking to people who approached us. Right. So we weren't making nuisances of ourselves. She was quite offended that we were there. And uh, and I essentially I said that uh, that. Um, would you ever consider having hosting an event called Walk a Mile in His Work Boots, right? Walk a Mile in His Shoes. 
Um, cause she had a, a son who was there in high heels. Right. I think it was about 12. No oh boy. Right? Yeah. And, uh, she said, Oh, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes, you know, being a teenager and all of that. I wouldn't want to go through that again. I'm like, no, like we're talking about domestic violence here. Right. You do realize that there are men who are victims of domestic violence and there are women who are perpetrators. Right. And she's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, well, mm. and uh, then she like kind of stormed off in a huff. And then a one of the male, uh, one of the, the one male organizer who was there, the one, the one guy who was in a, in a organizer shirt, uh, comes up and says, you know, she's really upset. You know, what did? Is there a problem? Like, you know, and uh, he was very diplomatic. Um, compared to the women that we dealt with. One of them stole our pamphlets. Um, she was like, give me those! And, like, grabbed our pamphlets and ran off. Yeah, that's not yelling, violent or anything. Yelling, men already have too many rights! Um, but, yeah, she, literally, she did. She did. Um, but, and we were just, like, left there standing, like, complete jaws agape going, did that just happen? Um, but, uh essentially this guy comes up and he's like okay so what's going on and i said well you know here's the thing right it, it really doesn't matter you know domestic violence is a generational issue it really doesn't matter if the kids grow up seeing dad beat up mom or mom beat up dad or both of them beating each other what they're learning is that violence is the way to resolve conflict right that that's what they're learning that violence is the go-to method to resolve conflict and uh so they're either going to end up uh, more likely to be abusive as, as adults or more likely to be, um, you know, a victim of abuse as adults. Well, that's right? the and other thing. When you, uh, when you grow up in a situation where one side always wins because they're violent and the other side always capitulates because they're not, you, you basically learn that you can either be the person who deals with conflict through violence or you can be the person who deals with conflict, not through avoiding the conflict, but Loses through avoiding conflict. dealing with the conflict by, yeah. by avoiding acknowledging that it's happening. And, yeah. and that ends up in an entirely other area of dysfunction, and you do end up getting abused. And I think a lot of henpecked, henpecked husbands are in that situation where oh. they can't talk back. How, how would they talk back, you know? Uh, they they won't they don't have a pathway to talk back and the only thing they can do is either take it keep their heads down do what they're told okay or become the abuser and they don't want to be the, the way, abuser so okay the way I've heard some women talk to their husbands in front of me like as a server right you know I I never hear I never hear men talk to their wives in that way. Right with that level of disrespect in front of other people, I he I would hear it like not all the time, right? But it wasn't uncommon. It was not uncommon to hear a woman say something to a man that there was like there was literally no way he could realistically respond to that without causing a scene. So he just had to swallow it. Yeah, and uh, you know you have that situation of. They're not just, they're not just policed by their, their past experience and their upbringing. They also know that all of society looks at them as, uh, the depository for women's ire. Um, and as, as the, the rightful target, but certainly if he stands up for himself, now he's the abuser. I mean, and that's not helping to stop the cycle either. No, so like, it's that situation with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, um, if if things are the way they are starting to look with them, he was essentially in a position where he couldn't talk back uh, because that makes him the bad guy, where he couldn't defend himself because that makes him the bad guy, where he lives in a country where if he goes for help, he's likely to be labeled uh, the problem and sent to uh, perpetrator uh, reform, essentially. Um, she'd be able to take him to court and take everything on the way out of the marriage. Uh, and, and he'd still be the bad guy. Uh, and he, his options basically are duck your head and say, okay, 
or and and take it and and figure out what you did wrong uh which you know if you didn't do anything wrong you got to make something up or you got to take what she made up or become the bad guy and he he had to let that go all this I mean, time I, I, just, I saw him i saw him on camera you know like on video smashing things like slamming covered doors breaking stuff uh mm -hmm. throwing things around and all of that but it's, it's such a short clip and we don't get to see any of the lead up to that um yeah we just, i was gonna say until you get to a point where you can't take it anymore yeah. you can't let yeah. it go anymore and when like you reach was... that breaking point it's not they they don't call it a breaking point because you just decided you're not going to put up with this shit anymore it's a no. breaking point because you lose the control that you need to continue putting up with this shit anymore yeah and it's it's like so i'm looking at him and i'm thinking well okay so every single other woman in his life has said this is not in his character right there's like a massive list of of people who have come out and said this is this is absolutely not in his character not even the drinking not like it was I, the video was filmed as far as i know before noon right and he was already drunk and high right because I don't know. Wasn't escape? Yeah, it, it, it apparently it wasn't in his character to do that, right? But he's drunk and high, and he's uh, and she comes and she's like, "What are you doing, honey?" And and then he's like, "What do you think?" And he's you know like, "What have you been doing?" And and all of this stuff, and he starts slamming things around, and he drinks more, and he like starts slamming the cupboard doors shut, and a pane of glass breaks, and and then uh, he cuts, apparently she threw a vodka bottle at him after she shut her camera off, right? And uh, it uh, cut the tip of his finger off. And then he wrote some shit on the fridge with his own blood. He was yeah. that high. He was that, he was that fucked up, right? And I'm just looking at, like, we... We walked in on this, you know, uh, maybe 11, 10 hours and 45 minutes into it. Yeah. That might be when we walked in, right? And uh, and I've listened to 11 hours of that shit of somebody finally being driven to the point where they're like, you know, saying shit that they would never say and, uh, and doing stuff that they would never do. And, uh, and I got to say, you know, like, He's he's got all of the witnesses. He's got apparently eighty-seven uh, surveillance videos, you know, supporting his story. Eighty-seven different surveillance videos supporting his story. He's got seventeen eyewitnesses supporting his story that she was the abusive one, right? According to his lawsuit. Now that all needs to come out in court. That all needs to be aired. And, and and scrutinized and all of that. But all I can say is it's looking a lot less cut and dried than Amber Heard was uh, was indicating. Made it out to be, yeah. 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 So. yeah. so there's our response to that uh, super chat. Like, we, our jury still has to be out on that. I mean, it could be the same story, but in the other direction. But the current evidence sort of spells uh her being well, the one doing that you, you know, know it's it's like it's, it's i i'm it's i'm open probably to, not i'm um, open to both stories like but but I, you, you have to actually look at the yeah. evidence and you have to actually yeah the consider. current evidence that's coming out looks like it's it's uh she's been gaslighting him exactly as you described well and and you have yeah. to look at the fact that you know like women are actually capable of doing this women are ape, uh, actually capable of getting a man so so twisted up on himself right through the through gaslighting and through other other things that like my friend's husband was never physically violent with her he was never physically violent with her she swore that up and down she still swears that to this day he has never he had never been physically violent with her. All you know, it this takes is a, 
Actually, this is another point regarding men. When you you talk about that, women who abuse this way don't ever have to be physically violent because what have we discussed before when a man gets to that breaking point? More often than not, when he snaps, he doesn't go after the woman. You know, no, unless he he's in a situation of immediate danger where she's being physically violent or where she's done something that, that uh, in, 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 while she's still in the vicinity, leads him to go off, he's more likely yeah, to kill like, himself. Like, like she aborts their child and then throws the fetus at him or something like that. Right. Yeah. Something really egregious. Yeah. But you know, more like, often than not, you see men will, will kill themselves. You know, and that's yeah. Terrence Pop has a, a gut-wrenching story that he talks about one of his oh, friends yeah. uh, who was the reason he didn't commit suicide um, because his he saw the aftermath of his friend's suicide and that was as a result of the psychological abuse, the particular type of psych psychological abuse that takes place in parental alienation cases where the mother cuts off all avenue of contact between the father and his children and uh, strives to uh, exploit him financially, basically, uh, as much as humanly possible and demonizes him and ruins his reputation and, and everything until he's completely broken. And his his family's gone, his purpose is gone, his reputation's gone, and he is going to be struggling financially. And there are a lot of men in that situation that do commit suicide. And that's one of yeah. the reasons I pointed that out in the opener, um, that feminists call it abuse when a man commits suicide in that situation. It's yeah. not abuse, well, it's no, an attempted no. escape. It's it's not abuse um, if they do it quietly in their own home. It, it's just abuse if they do it publicly or leave a note laying blame. Well, they right. thought it was abuse when Earl Silverman did it. Or or in any way inconvenience the woman. If if it's paid attention to at all whatsoever, then it's bad. If it yeah, leaves Earl her without the money she was going for. Earl Silverman left a note, That's essentially. That's true, he did. Here's why I did it, and, and I hope my suicide will get attention for this problem. Right? And so then the feminists had to come out and say, we didn't have anything to do with this, even though it was like, what? fucking an eight-year struggle against the feminist establishment um and he it was it was an eight-year battle that he fought and lost right and uh and there was at at no point did it wasn't even that at no point did any feminist step up and try to help him feminists were fighting him every fucking step of the way every fucking step of the way every time he went in front of the human rights uh, tribunal to beg for a hearing. He was up against a lawyer paid for by the Alberta Network of Women's Shelters, the uh, Alberta Council of Women's Shelters, right? Who were arguing that that the government doesn't need to give him any money, right? And it was run at the time by a woman who refused to go on a TV program with him because to even discuss publicly discuss male victims might lend legitimacy to the idea that they exist. Yep, and so we're we're looking we're looking at the the feminists defending their dogma to the point of driving someone to suicide, and then when he does that, they call him, uh, they call what he did a threat to women's rights. Yeah, an attack on feminism. And they basically darvoed him. Um, they denied their responsibility, their their part in what happened. Uh, you know, uh, they attacked him as as a misogynist and and they reversed the victim and offender there they they basically played victim of his suicide yeah they're the victims of his death because we now people can't ignore this. what yeah. they did yeah oh it was absolutely it was disgusting it was disgusting and then i still have still have that fucking asshole take down mras on Twitter saying, you never did anything to help him. I don't even think you knew him. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, I'm the one who sat for four hours on the phone with him numerous times, right? Talking about his situation. I'm the one who freaking made videos um, where I posted, you know, please donate and stuff and spread spread things around for him. 
and and got him more donations for his shelter and i'm i'm the one who actually like freaking gave gave him advice you know for his uh you know how to how to you know i guess tweak his uh his attempt at the second uh human rights tribunal hearing right all of those things you know i'm the one who sat in a denny's uh across from him on my way down uh from edmonton to um montana bozeman montana right when i was driving down there i stopped and had had lunch and and you know talked with him and stuff like that i'm i'm the one who tried to help him right and all of your fucking friends right you didn't even it wasn't even that you ignored him it wasn't even that you did nothing it was they actively worked against him if you did nothing i could could forgive it but you actively worked against him you actively opposed him you actively blocked him you actively all of your fucking friends that you're defending actively worked to prevent him from being able to do what he wanted to do, which was help men in the situation that he had found himself in 20 years prior. Right. And I'm, I'm just like, I'm just this guy. And then he's like, you're using him as, as a, you know, oh yeah. Like feminists don't fucking use tragedies to further their agenda. I'm sorry. You know, like, I'm not, I don't use him to further my agenda. I use him as an example of somebody who's been completely destroyed by the system, right? And, uh, and why, uh, an example of why the system should change. Yeah, the, the example of, all right, if you want men to step up and, and actually do what you say, you know, do something about men's issues, do something about men's situations, start their own shelters and so on, then when someone like Earl Silverman comes along, don't attack him. Don't actively work within the government system against his success at that. Don't actively strive to deny him uh, funding. Don't actually uh, label his efforts at helping men get out of abusive homes an attack on their the 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 abuser the abusers themselves uh don't don't pretend that men who are trying to escape abusive situations are themselves the abusers uh because that's that's bullshit you can't have it both ways you can't have uh men don't do anything to fix their own situations mras don't do anything for men and then also have when they do what we say they don't do, we will demonize them for doing it, mischaracterize it, and do everything we can to make sure that it fails. You, you, you get one or the other. Because if you try to do both, then we will use the second one against you every time you come out with the first one. And, and we're justified in doing that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, no. 100%. Now I'm going to go like on to the next super chat. Uh, Mr. Roboto gave us $5 and said, cannot stay for the show, but here's a token for now. And Leviathan GL gave us $5 and said, as someone who used to be Polly, it's a gigantic mistake. I'm not going to get yeah, into a long no. discussion about this, but I will say this. Um, from experience, a lot of people go into that with the idea that it's just going to be one big party. And well, the, what they find the, out is the reality versus the intent is I yeah. think that's the disconnect there, because on one hand, you have actually functioning polysexual, let's say, relationships, because you still have like your one partner that you're in love with, but then you have sex with other people. Sure, whatever. But most of the time in practice, it ends up being open relationships and poly relationships end up being code words for guys not getting any action and the woman being alone with other men. And that's not at all the intent or what people signed up for and right. it ends up being on the losing end every time for the guy and it's like ah in practice it always they get the short end of the stick so well in practice in my experience right in practice it ends up being uh polyamory and polysexual relationships uh when they're suggested by the guy right he's he's essentially the guy who just like he does not want an extramarital uh, affair, like a, a sexual liaison, right? A blowjob in a back alley, whatever, right? With a woman he'll never see again. He does not want that to destroy his relationship. Okay, so 
you have a guy who maybe is is good at having sex land in his lap and very bad at saying no to it when it does and he's just like yeah no so i i think we should get into this and and i i think my wife feels the same way because you know that's women and men are like the same um and for the woman if the woman suggests it it's i'm shopping for better offers a lot of times you that that is true but i a lot of times especially with the younger set you you see they've been raised post-sexual revolution with this idea that you can divorce accountability and re personal responsibility from your sex life everything else you might they might be told you know you've got to be accountable with your bank account you've got to be mindful of your educational choices you know you can't just go uh, taking underwater basket weaving and expecting to come out of that with a profession right um, but nobody's allowed to judge you for anything you do sexually and you're not allowed to be to, to to feel bad or feel that you have made unwise choices and so they, they go into this with this idea that there is no uh potential there are no for consequence when they they engage in actions that are maybe not necessarily um not necessarily the wisest choices for them and then they get they get stuck in a situation where one of them's jealous or one of them gets hurt um, somebody gets hurt by someone from outside the relationship and they both don't know how to deal with it uh, somebody gets a sexually transmitted disease uh, one side of the relationship finds that they are easily able to find partner after partner after partner and the other one doesn't uh, and feels left out you know where they they aren't necessarily like they're just haphazardly going through this and they end up in a very hurt damaged situation and I from from what I've seen um, a lot of those relationships end up in that situation and you know if you're not you can't just... I don't know. all I know all I know is every situation in which a woman talked a man into a polyamorous relationship uh, she ended up dumping him and then going into a monogamous relationship, relationship with, with the next guy with yeah the next um, a, little bit, a little bit above the guy I've she seen that happen as well but I have seen I've seen a lot of well and it, you got to realize you know like I said I used to be um, very active in the pagan community so I was like I, I, I was part of a coven I went to pagan festivals I you know there was that is an idea that is a lot more popularized among pagans than it is among say Christians um, <clears throat> you don't find a whole lot of of uh, sects of uh, Christianity that even allow uh, uh, polygamy much less uh, like polyamory the idea of, of a, a woman also being able to be with a lot of different guys and it not necessarily um, it, you know, generally speaking, it's committed in in uh, the polyamorous relationship. It, there's a degree of commitment versus an open relationship, which is when you're not supposed to necessarily have any degree of commitment to the the uh, outside sexual liaisons. But uh, again, like a lot of times, people people go into this with this great level of naivety, where they think, oh, you know, this is just going to be fun, and we're going to enjoy each other, and and uh, you know we're gonna free love and 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 we're gonna have a great big party and and it turns out that no actually just because the sexual revolution happened doesn't necessarily mean that your sexual choices have no consequences and that there aren't going to be things that you're gonna have to deal with and uh, that it's it's just gonna be easy for you to have sex with a whole lot of people and then emotionally detach yourself from those people or emotionally detach yourself from maybe your partner having sex with somebody that's not you and they get like I've seen uh, very very deeply committed relationships break up because of that and I've seen uh, the the third partner or the fourth partner or whatever come in and uh, try to try to break up the original relationship uh, and and have and have seen that go very badly. I've seen all kinds of stuff like that. It's it's just a, it's not that it can't be done. It's not that it's always a mistake to do it, but it's definitely a mistake to think that it's something that uh, you can do differently than you would do any other committed relationship. 
um, and, and that, that you don't have to be as mindful of your sexual choices. No, you have to be more mindful. You have to take more responsibility. You have to be ready to be accountable for things that you wouldn't necessarily uh, experience in a committed monogamous relationship with one other person. Every person you bring into your relationship like that adds a new layer and level of complication and a new layer and level of possibilities that uh, if you're not ready to deal with them, they can wreck you and or, or you can end up hurting somebody and you don't mean to. Um, you can end up ripping somebody's heart out and even if your intentions were perfectly innocent, after you've done it, you still have on your conscience and in your history the fact that you did that to somebody. So as far as, uh, as, far as that goes, um, I can see it, a, a, a person looking back on, on their life uh, as in, in a poly relationship saying, yeah, it was a gigantic mistake and it, it might have been for them. Um, going into it lightly is always, always a gigantic mistake. But uh, it's that way with relationships in general. Um, that's like the most, if you love somebody, the most, uh, most genuine way you can show your love for that person is to take responsibility for your impact on their welfare. And to take responsibility for ensuring that they understand their impact on yours. So then there's the, uh, the MRA consent narrative in a nutshell. Um, but uh, I think we have, we have chewed this one up and spit it out. So I, I'm going to go ahead and call it. Our sausage is starting to get a bit long and I do have to work tonight. So outside of this. So with that, um, I, Anna, I think you said you were starting something new. Is it something that you're ready, ready to, uh, to shill or is, should, do we need to wait on that? Um, just Patreon as always. That's about it for now. Okay. Oh, we're yeah. mid moving, uh, potentially it just kind of, uh, snuck up on us. So, so it's still in the works. a little bit on hold. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Then the only other thing to, uh, that I can think of to shill at this point is ICMI. And, uh, so I will remind everybody to now there's a, there's an ICMI account now on Twitter. Um, and I cannot remember the damn <laughs> Twitter account. I believe I just had it as has have it as at ICMI twenty nineteen. But if you visit uh ICMI twenty nineteen dot ICMI dot info, you can also uh check out the latest updates. You can sign or up just, for email updates. Or um, just ICMI dot info. Uh, ICMI yeah, it'll dot take you right there. Redirect. Yep, uh, and and you can find out what's going on uh, with the planning and setup of the International Conference on Men's Issues. Uh, you can get early bird tickets. Um, there's a sale going on right now, so this is a good time to uh, to to pick them up. Uh, and with that, I, I don't think there is anything else. Does anybody have anything else that's going on that needs to be pointed out before we? Not at this time. All right. Well, in no that problem. case, thanks everybody for sticking out the long sausage, um, and uh, thanks to my to my great co-hosts for helping to build the long sausage. And uh, always, thanks, oh, definitely. Thanks to everyone in the background who helps make HBR talk happen. And good night, all. <laughs>